Connie Brown is a 34 year veteran from in the classroom, and she holds a bachelor's degree in theater from the University of Colorado Scobuffs and master's of education in integrated teaching from Leslie College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She's taught theater, English and communications for middle and high school students at all skill levels. And she was a lead facilitator for a gifted center for 10 years. As a resource teacher for gifted education in a large school district in Metro Denver, Colorado, Connie focused on programming for secondary gifted students at more than 15 schools. She's been a presenter at the World Council, Council for Gifted Children at the University of New South Wales, Australia, and facilitates sessions regularly at state and national educational venues. Connie currently enjoys guest teaching locally, providing online instruction for international students with DDC Talented Youth Program and leading workshops to help teachers and parents develop accessible tools and strategies that engage and empower student education curiosity and potential. Connie, I'm excited that you're doing uh, this presentation for uh, about secondary students. We don't get enough of them. And so please welcome the primary needs of the gifted secondary student and Connie Brown. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I can't tell you how glad I am to be here and talking about the primary needs of secondary gifted students. So I wanna thank you and I wanna thank uh, everyone in the audience for being here as well. Uh, so Mark told you a little bit about me. Um, I have my, uh, in fact, I'm not even gonna go over this cause he went over all of it already, but I do want to share that today's a really special day for me. It's my heart anniversary. So um, this is a much better way to spend my day than uh, I was spending it last year at this time. I had open heart surgery and they did a whole rebuild with valves and uh, all the things. So um, this is a great, this is a great night for me. Um, thanks for, for being part of it, everyone. Um, so I wanna tell you what my presentation is about. It's about actualizing potential. What it's not about is how to get my child to go to the best college. And so I think that's a really important thing to understand going into it. Um, as a teacher, that was never my intention. I wanted to help students become the best version of themselves. And so as I, um, when people ask me now what I, what I teach, I say I teach happiness. And when I say that, I mean that in the sense of the ancient Greek term where, where the the concept actually originated. And there, happiness, happy was a verb. It was something that was pursued and, and sought after. Um, and that developed later into Aristotle's um, term arete, which means excellence or actualized potential. And so when I think about what I teach, that's what I'm doing. And for me, the path to uh, happiness to arete is developing student agency. And I think when we talk about the primary need of secondary gifted students, it's this idea that they can in fact be agents of their future and their present. Um, so in student agency, just like in uh, video game agency, the student has control over significant choices in his or her life or her studies. And then those choices are actually choices that have consequences in the real world. They're not just like you can do the assignment and turn it in or not. Um, they're much bigger than that. And uh, hopefully the student has enough information to anticipate and explore those choices and consequences. I will tell you that they don't have enough information initially to do that, but we wanna foster that and nurture that. So the idea about student agency, um, Ellen Langer is a UCLA researcher and she came up with this idea. Well, she went through quite a lot of research and showed us that what keeps us engaged in playing, for example, the game of Yahtzee, it's not the 5% chance of rolling a Yahtzee, it's that we're in control and we know that we're the ones who are rolling the dice. It's really that we're the ones rolling the dice. We want to give our children that opportunity as adults. And before you think, oh my God, she's going to talk about rainbows and unicorns for the entire session, which are lovely, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. What I want you to understand is that this is about inviting the student to be an active participant in the decisions that move him forward in life. So it's much like going to a doctor and at the doctor's office, 
we want, we want the doctor to be the expert. We still want our teachers to be the expert. We still want to have curriculum, but we want the patient in this case to be able to make some healthy decisions about what way he or she's going to go. The doctor isn't going to give them one choice. They're going to give them a variety of choices and let them learn how to handle it. I'm just same with the, you know, going to the dentist. I wouldn't expect anyone to stop getting their six month checkup or to not go to a dentist if there was some kind of a dental emergency like a cavity. But we don't want parents to have to be calling their children when they're in college or beyond and telling them to brush their teeth. So um, that's kind of what I want you to think about in terms of agency. And I've broken this up. I, I was going to try and talk for like just 20 minutes. And then if you know me, that was just such a joke. So, uh, so I'm going to break this into different parts. So I want to address first, if you're an educator, how do you support agency? And this is for people who maybe don't know very much about gifted education. So if, if you don't know a lot about gifted education, you definitely want to learn some. But also just forgive yourself for a little bit. My gosh, your plate is really full. Start very simply and just build from there. I will say the first well, I don't know that I'd put these in a particular order, but one of the most important things is to make sure that you're pre-testing your students. So before you start a unit, make sure that you're not teaching these students something that they already know. I worked with a teacher a few years ago and she and I put a unit together and um, she'd been very concerned about how she was being received by the students. And uh, she gave the pretest and she called me at 8.30 at night and she was kind of in tears. And she said, they all got 85% or better on the pretest. And I said, you know, we've got a framework of what we're gonna do in this unit, but we're gonna have to sit down. And we, we did some fast work that night of, of reevaluating what it was that we wanted the student outcomes to be. So that pretesting is super important. Um, also, teachers should know and elevate the students' advanced learning goals. Many of the districts I've watched over the last few years have been working hard to find a system that works, that makes uh, getting information about the advanced learning plans streamlined so teachers and parents and students uh, can all access it easily. But even if you are not in a district where that's happened yet, or you're not happy with the, the way that it's happened yet, um, you know who your identified gifted learners are because they should be marked, they're marked. Um, so talk to them and ask them if there's a way that you can elevate an advanced learning plan goal for them in your class. We did that for 25 years before, um, before these things started to get streamlined into ways that, that could make sense um, or be easily accessible. Um, another thing, this is really simple, offer book choices. I work with so many, first of all, I have worked with so many amazing teachers, um, but I'm often surprised by the number of teachers who are insistent that this is the one book that we will read. And not just for one unit out of the year, but for every single unit. And I had a teacher a few years ago um, and she decided to do a survey. So she kept pre and post data on student engagement and um, found uh, between two different units that when the students had a choice, the um, classroom engagement went up by about 50%. So that was, that was just an exciting thing, just offering, you know, instead of one text to offer them five, or I even sometimes let them bring in a title of their own if it, if it met sort of the goals we were looking at in terms of literature. Uh, in fact, on that note, this little phrase at the end of a prompt was a godsend for me. And this changed things tremendously in my classroom when I just started putting, or another project of your choice, talk to your teacher first. I'll tell you that probably 80 to 85% of my classes, every kid did the prompt that I gave them. But there was always about 10 or 15% of the kids who which is like one or two kids, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> um, it, or it felt like it. And, and that's kind of across, I guess that's not very good math, but across the year, uh, just a few kids wanted to do something different for certain units. And it just gave them such a sense of empowerment. Um, and they usually had projects that were better than what I had come up with in my prompt. So um, it's kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, so I'd suggest adding that to your prompts at the end. Um, another thing is just invite students to make unpredictable uh, connections. So uh, I was an English teacher and 
oftentimes I would have in my gifted classrooms students who did not want to be gifted in English. That was not their area of um, strength and they're not, not their area of interest or enjoyment. Um, and so when we would read literature, a lot of times I would ask them to uh, share with me um, a mathematical equation of the main characters' relationships with each other or graph the, um, the central conflict or something like that. So something that uh, leans into their strengths, but also um, still connects to your own uh, curriculum. And then the, the last thing is please be, please be prepared as a secondary teacher, especially with your gifted students, to reteach study skills fluidly and without judgment. Um, as if a lot of you saw this week, I have a little asterisk there because Matt Z uh, Zakreski, who's um, with uh, the Neurodiversity um, podcast, uh, I know Keg T posted his video this week, but the, of the performance cliff, and that cannot be more real. Um, these students, they, they often, they have just coasted through elementary and, and even middle school, and by the time they get to high school, they don't have the skills for taking notes. They don't have the skills for reading signage, uh, for navigating maybe a textbook or making files on their folder. And we definitely don't want to say to them, oh, come on, you're supposed to be gifted. We want to just gently give them the tools and be re rejoiceful that we're giving them something that they actually need to use. Make sure that they have to use it. <laughs> Not that they have to use it because you're telling them, but it's actually something that's valuable for them. But do, do be prepared to reteach those skills because a lot of students have come in and they've never had to use them. Um, oh, uh, this is a transition. So if you are a teacher uh, and you have some questions now, go ahead and put those in the chat and I'll come back to a Q&A at the end. But we're gonna move on now to the supportive adult. Um, in a child's life. So this might be a parent or a guardian. It might be an auntie or a, a, a granddaddy. Um, but the supportive adult, adult in, in a gifted secondary student's life, your main role is to be a coach and a cheerleader. Um, and I will tell you that the very most important thing that you can do for yourself is to practice and model excellent self-care. Uh, it is not easy to raise a gifted child. And if you have a twice exceptional child, that is also, that is even exponentially harder. So be gentle with yourself. You're doing the very best that you can. I have no doubt of it, especially if you joined this tonight, there's no question in my mind, you're doing the very, very best that you can. And so is your child probably. So be gentle with yourself and with them and, um, you know, make sure that you're making a work-life balance so that you are, giving some of your time in both places, if that's what you need to do, be aware and celebrate your strengths um, and be aware of your emotions and what triggers you have for your emotions. Be aware of your own needs and create personal boundaries. I had a parent a few years ago and I thought this was so brilliant. Um, I taught middle school for a long time and uh, 10 years in a middle school gifted center. And I can't tell you how many times parents show up, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so forgot their violin or so-and-so forgot their essay or whatever it was. And I had a mom say, they get one a semester. I will drop what I'm doing and help them out one time a semester. They get to decide which one that is. But those personal boundaries, of course, we want to help our kids. And, and sometimes we just drop everything to be there for them. But it is so important for them to really decide, hmm, is this the crisis that I want to call for my, my one lifeline uh, this semester? And of course, have a growth mindset. And that isn't just about learning. That's about everything. It, if today is bad, it's not going to stay bad. Tomorrow's probably going to be better. Our lives move in and out just like the tide in the ocean. And, uh, and we can't control everything, but we can control uh, where, how we're looking at it and how we calm ourselves and try to move forward in a healthy way. Here's some other things though, that as the supportive adult, you can help with. Um, help with that goal setting. If your child is an identified gifted learner, then they have an advanced learning plan. It's a law. So um, that advanced learning plan or ALP includes one academic and one, some people call it affective, some people call it social emotional. I call it soft but essential. One academic, one soft but essential goal. Um, and help them think about what what that goal is going to be. 
make sure that you are supporting them to base it on their strengths. If they are not, if they are not interested or, or feel really strong about their math, don't push them to have a math goal. If, if they're a great reader, encourage them to maybe find a genre that they want to read. Maybe they want to read 10 books about dystopias um, over the year, or maybe they want, whatever it is that they want to do, you want it to be based on their strengths. And then encourage them to work toward the goal. Don't encourage them to complete it. Don't get, did you get on it today? Did you, are you done yet? Or how close are you? If they're, if their school is addressing this correctly, they should not be making the end goal a percentage, right? Because it's just because they read eight out of 10 books doesn't mean they got 80% on their ALP. It's about forward progress. Um, and that's why I have that picture at the bottom of the screen here of the lady running up the steps in the stadium. Um, you know, the first time that you go to Red Rocks to, to run the stairs, you're probably not going to make it to the top unless you've already been training a lot. So it's all right if your child only makes it halfway up, if they only make it halfway to their goal. At the end, you want to reflect with them what they did right and what they did well and how they could do even more than that next time on some other goal. Um, another thing you can do is find, help them find a mentor for support. Uh, I'll have some links at the end of this presentation to help you find mentors, but they don't all have to be paid for. Uh, mentors can be family members or neighbors who um, are really good in a particular field. So uh, that's, that's always helpful too. But I think your most important job is to be a listener and a cheerleader. And somebody said to me the other day, um, you know, I, I thought my job was to like get them to high, get them through high school and then get them into whatever their next step is. But I realize now, like, I want to, I want to have a relationship with my child so that I'm the one they call when they're happy about something. And I'm the one, I want to spend time with my grandchildren later in life. And I want to have my children come back home for, for family meals and, and other things. So that, you know, that's, that's where I want you to focus is uh, being that listener and cheerleader and not reminding them all the time that they're gifted and they need to be doing such and such. Um, here's another thing that's really helpful is by the time a child is in high school, they should be pretty independent about um, communicating with the, uh, the other adults in their working life. So start sixth or seventh grade by helping them learn to write emails to their teachers. And there's a link here uh, on just some great tips on how to write emails. You can start out writing them together uh, with your child sitting next to you and you can CC them when you write to the teacher, but then ultimately kind of gradually uh, release that, um, that, that responsibility over to them. And maybe by eighth or ninth grade, they're writing their emails to their teachers and their counselors and they're CCing you. And try to be a fly on the wall when they CC you. Avoid jumping in and telling uh, the uh, counselor or the teacher or the child how to work this through. Um, that's what agency is, is they're learning how to work it through. Of course, model respectful communication yourself. Um, and another thing that's just kind of fun, uh, and I, again, middle school. So um, encourage uh, that ability to communicate well with adults by helping them do appropriate storytelling. We want whatever they are telling to be long enough to be informative so, you know, have the who, what, when, where, why, and how, but we also want it to be short enough to be engaging. And some of you know that our gifted kiddos can drone on. So uh, I used to have fun just saying, well, like, let's make it a tweet, which used to be 140 characters, but like three sentences. Can you tell me what that movie was about in three sentences? Can you, um, uh, you know, th th that helps them learn how to take turns when they're telling stories too, and when they're having conversations. Um, for just sort of like nuts and bolts around the house, provide and discuss strategies for success, like creating a to-go list. Um, you know, I, the Holderness family has that video of the song glass as well, like keys and phone, but you can start that with, uh, with like school bags and, um, uh, soccer bags and dance bags or whatever you have, have a checklist that just is on an index card and goes right into the bag. Um, so that it's ready to go. You don't have to harp about 
um, if the bag is organized well or anything, it's just giving them that checklist um, and help them manage that. And you can attach the checklist with a, um, a bag, uh, you know, a luggage uh, tag. Um, landing and launching pads at home, even when they start driving, just having a place where the car keys live is super helpful for the whole family. You might put um, pictures of tidy. I used to have pictures of tidy around the classroom, but also pictures of tidy in the house are often helpful. Um, if you have, and, and and it's important that there's not just one way to do tidy. Somebody told me the other day, there are 200 ways to load a dishwasher and they're all appropriate. So, um, so help them have conversations with them about, you know, what to, what works for them, especially in their own room, what works for them in terms of organizing materials um, and space and do provide definitely a study space and materials and time and quiet for them in, in the home so that they do have a place that they can concentrate when they're doing their work. If you're into family calendars, I recommend digital. Those are amazing. Um, and here's something I think is super important. And again, this came from a parent um, when I was a parent who the, the child had gone on to high school, but she said, you know, once he got there, I had so little contact with him. He was in sports. He was out with friends. He was doing this. And so they started having weekly dates. Um, she would meet him at uh, Starbucks or they would take a hike together, or it could even be something around the house. But the idea of the dates, and this was what she told me was key, and it worked so well for her, um, was that she did very little talking. And she definitely, when she talked, she didn't give advice. She didn't tweak it. She didn't give her opinion. She just asked questions and listened. Um, and then when they do have questions, uh, it's great to have answers because you're, you know, you're an amazing parent and you have a lot of wisdom and you have a lot of experience, but it's also important to help to, to let them know they can find the answers to things too. So encourage them to go to websites or videos or read articles. Um, and, uh, that actually segues into the next segment, uh, segment which is uh, talking about academic programming. So if you have a question about like parenting stuff, throw that into the chat now and Mark can ask those questions later. Um, in terms of uh, high school programming, a lot of parents ask me about well, what do I do? My child's gonna go to high school. And um, one of my favorite sayings is uh, when you know one gifted student, you know one gifted student. So I can't give you a blanket answer for how to do this right for every single kid. I will tell you that um, NAGC has a um, list of gifted education standards and those would be wonderful to check out. That link is also at the end, it's on this slide, but um, that's a national movement and something to definitely consider. Uh, looking at, this is for example, standard one learning and development. Um, these educators who are working successfully with gifted students need to recognize their personal strengths and needs, investigate their personal identity, um, know that their growth is the result of meaningful and challenging learning activities that address that student's unique characteristics and needs. So for example, I'm working with a writing student internationally right now. He's in Asia and um, his his strength area, one, uh, his, is, his is art. He loves sculptor, sculpture and the young lady I'm working with um, loves dance. And so we are addressing that as we talk about learning more about writing. Um, and then also consider, keep, keep the future in mind and work toward uh, goals that are matching their interests and strengths. GT Center programming is available in some places in the state. We have in Jeffco, I know there were there are two really great high school GT centers. Um, there's a really great one in Fort Collins. Uh, I'm not familiar with other public school center programs, but there are some private um, school center programs as well. And if there are more, I'm delighted to hear about them. Uh, but with the center programming, we want well, I know that the teachers are focusing on cognitive, physical, emotional, and social growth. Uh, some of the programs use autonomous learner models. Some have more of a STEM or STEAM problem-based learning uh, focus. 
there are some arts academies and there are early colleges and technical schools that also are uh, super helpful if you want to pick a specialized program for your child. If you just want to go to the, or if your child just wants to go to the neighborhood uh, school or a neighborhood school, um, know that there, there are going to be honors and advanced courses. Don't force your child to take them all. Take what is indicated. I had a young man who went through a third level of calculus in high school, and he never took an advanced reading course, an advanced English class. He was fine taking the other classes. He still went to a really great college and he makes a lot of money and lives outside of San Francisco right now. So um, know that, you know, your child doesn't have to be gifted all the time in every course. It's let them take honors and advanced as, as indicated. And some parents know the difference between advanced placement and international baccalaureate, and some don't. Um, I would encourage you and your child to do some research about that. Uh, AP is definitely uh, rigorous memorization and analysis. Uh, IB also has a rigorous uh, course of study, and they include that theory of knowledge course, which I just love. Um, both of those courses will offer opportunities to earn uh, credit in college. That's not why you take those courses. It's for the it's it's for the richness of the course. So. Um, and, and not all colleges will take the, the credit. Um, so it's important that your child doesn't go in thinking that they're just doing it for the credit. It's for the rigor um, and hopefully the vigor. And, uh, and it may or may not be a suitable fit for your, your child. Uh, concurrent college courses, different districts do this with different um, success. I know in DPS that they really, uh, they tend to, recognize that a lot of their students aren't going to be able to pay for this. So they have figured, they, they anticipate that and they've figured out ways to help the child connect with um, money uh, options. And these are students who are literally taking um, college credit, college courses during, during high school. And then the last uh, are technical and career programs. These are fantastic. And I have so many gifted uh, students who have thrived in such programs. So don't discount those. If that's something that really interests your child, please get them aware of that and interested in that um, and aware of the criteria as early as possible. Most programs you can't enter until about your junior or senior year, but um, there it, it's very um, competitive and they need to have a couple of good years in high school to get into those programs. Also, you know, in your local school especially, look at the extracurricular opportunities that are already there. Uh, students tell me all the time that that was what kept them in school and they feel like they got incredible richness from, from what they did with their yearbook program or their theater uh, class or their science fair. And oh my goodness, if you watch national news, I mean, our science fair winners on a national level every year are coming up with just cutting edge ideas and technology and, and science. So um, find out what extracurriculars are already available in your neighborhood high school. And then also, um, as much as possible, parents, I encourage you to provide mentors. If you can do private lessons, that's awesome. Don't feel like you have to do that. Um, see if you can find tutors, some again, like retired teachers often will volunteer their time to be tutors. They'll come into a school. I had a lot of retired teachers who came in and worked with students um, in the classroom. I even had a professor come in once and do a whole literary study with a small group of kids who were just so far ahead of my other students. Um, so see if you can find those. Field experts, again, those could be relatives and neighbors. Maybe your child is interested in physical therapy because um, he kinked up his knee during uh, soccer or something. And so uh, his physical therapist might allow him to come in and do some internships. And speaking of internships, most of our high schools, uh, at least in the metro area, and I would suspect outside of the metro area, if you asked, um, will have internship and apprentice programs in there, especially in the junior and senior year. And, you know, if you feel like your child needs extra support, don't be afraid to reach out for therapy. I would encourage for gifted students who are getting therapy or family ther therapy um, that you reach out to somebody who's experienced with gifted 
students. Um, and I do have some links for that at the end, not recommendations, but just links to uh, people who are experienced therapists in uh, with gifted and talented young people. And then finally, and I think I probably should have put this one first, but one of the things I encourage families to do always is have their child create a portfolio. And I, I actually, more importantly, I encourage students to, to do this. And this portfolio should start no later than grade nine. And that's, that's the beginning of high school. It should be digital, but it can have tangible pieces and they can take photos of those tangible pieces and put, put it into their portfolio. It should have syllabi from all of their classes. It should have programs from um, any, uh, uh, conferences that they attended or places that they presented. Um, much of the state now has required the senior capstone presentation. I think, I mean, I think it's required all over the state, but it's in different levels of um, evolution in each district. But those senior capstones should be going into the portfolio. Any work samples, a resume. This is something I would start, um, I would encourage your child to do early uh, because it's going to help them later on in school and in, and in career. And then the summers, you can almost always find universities or private gifted centers, um, activities that are especially for gifted uh, students. I have some links for that at the end of this too. Of course, in your school, that field specific FESCON or Young Leaders, FCCLA, DECA. Um, if your child wants to go to one of those, find a way to make that happen, um, even if they're you know, if they have to pick up an extra job to get some of the money from it. I have had so many students that have gotten to do amazing travel opportunity, and they did it uh, by asking different businesses to sponsor them. Uh, you know, what a great way to learn about marketing is to go out and, and ask some people to, to sponsor uh, you to go to a foreign country or something. And there is school and district-based travel that comes out quite a lot, um, hopefully after the pandemic moves to an endemic stage across the the planet um, that will come back in full force again. So um, this is that time where if you have any questions about uh, programming, go ahead and put that into the chat. But uh, I'd say in general, in terms of programming, we wanna do whatever we can to create a love for learning, that cognitive, social, physical, managerial, you know, the executive function, and always the forward thinking. Um, what not what do you wanna be when you grow up and what are you gonna do later on, but just how did it, does this help be, make you the person you wanna be? Um, and how are you improving in being the person that you wanna be or what were your roadblocks? The next section is about the soft but essential life skills. And um, these are things that can be taught at home and at school. And honestly, I have been so impressed with learning about this element. I thought I, when I was in the classroom, I thought I did some really amazing things with soft but essential life skills. Uh, the CASEL framework, honestly, has just upped that game so much in terms of my own self-awareness, um, my own social awareness. Uh, and my own relationship skills. So uh, I'd encourage you to check that out. You can Google that anywhere. Um, and then, um, but I, these are the two I focused on in my classroom were the self-awareness in, in, in the idea of, okay, today is bad. Tomorrow is going to be better. Um, this growth mindset of I'm not very good at writing now, but I, I can learn little pieces at a time and I don't have to be amazing tomorrow. I can be a little bit better tomorrow than I am today. Um, success comes in increments. And I think that that's one of the most important things that all of us can remember. We also need to remember what's in our control uh, and what is not in our control. And we need to focus on the things that are in our control because that makes us happier people. And I think that happier people are better able to pursue RTA. Um, an awareness of our own strengths, your own strengths is, uh, well, I, I want my students to know what their strengths are. I always had students who told me what they couldn't do, and I would help them turn that phrase around so that they knew what they could do um, and what they did well. 
and also learning to name emotions. That's a check-in I still do every single class, every week with my international students. They, we, we check in on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling and do we wanna talk about it? Um, and then their awareness of needs. It's okay to know that they don't do something well. It's just not where their focus needs to be. Um, in terms of self-management, ability to focus is really important. And we want to, again, incrementally move our students there. Uh, we want them to recognize their own healthy behaviors and we want them to manage their disruptive behaviors. So if I had a, um, a student who was coming in to class and was tired in the morning or sleeping through class, I'd have a conversation about, you know, what do you think is going on with that? Well, I didn't sleep very much last night. Well, how come? Well, I was doing, yeah, I was playing video games. Well, you talked to me about that a few days ago. Do you think that that's helping you out? You know, and just kind of guide them to thinking about it. Um, often they'll take the reins on that once they start to recognize it. Um, there's whole other things about, you know, addiction to videos and, and stuff, but um, in general, just recognizing disruptive behaviors allows somebody to, to respond to it. And always, always managing time materials and, motion, and emotions, but not necessarily in a way that's prescribed, in a way that they come up with it. Um, I, in the middle school, I would show students four or five different ways to organize materials, but I never told them they had to do it that way. And I certainly didn't grade them on whether or not they did it that way. It's about what's working for them. And I didn't expect them to get it figured out at the end of a unit. I expected them, I, I would get those students at seventh grade and I would hope that they had it figured out by the end of 10th grade, maybe 11th. Some didn't figure it out until much later. And I'm aware of that. But if it's forward movement, it's forward movement. And then this was a game changing uh, sentiment for me to learn too with my students and with my own children. Um, this sentence, I know that you can and will figure this out. I can't tell you as a teacher and as a parent how much of a fixer I was. I fixed things. So, um, and I still have to, I still have to battle it um, in my life, but now rather than coming up with a solution, I remind them first of all that I know, I'm confident they can and will figure this out. That, that sentence alone is a game changer. And then following it with, would you like suggestions or would you prefer some space? Um, if, if we can give them this, sometimes they need the space to be heard while they just vent. And other times they literally need physical space away from anybody so that they can figure, figure out what they wanna do next. So that's the end of the social emotional or soft but essential unit. So if you have questions about that, this is the time to put them in. And we're on almost, I think we're this the last, the last section before question and answer. So I'm excited because um, I feel like I've been talking way too much. Uh, so post-secondary, post-secondary choices. Uh, first of all, you're not the driver. You're not the navigator. And in fact, you'll be lucky if you're a backseat passenger and um, so, so just let, just know that like some kids get into college and they just like go for it and they just nail it. And other kids have a very circuitous uh, path and they're all going to get there. And our job, again, I, you want to, you want to hang out with your grandkids later in life. You want to um, have your child come to you when they're struggling with something. So the best thing that you can do is ask them what they're thinking and help them maybe with the research. I personally, as a, as a middle school teacher, I did a unit every eighth grade on looking at not just college opportunities, but post-secondary opportunities. Um, and so I provided all kind of research for them uh, in all facets, and then they did a presentation. And I encourage teachers to do that again in 10th or at least, at the very least, 11th grade. Um, and sometimes 11th is probably the best choice. Uh, but these are some articles that you might enjoy reading and that your child, more importantly, your child might enjoy reading. And this book, uh, I have put a link to the website of Colleges That Change Lives. It's got so much information in it. Um, I would really encourage that. And then the other thing is um, when you're having those conversations about what's going to happen after high school, discuss your budget briefly. 
and just be, you know, clear about it. And, and if you know that your budget is super limited, the earlier you can have that conversation, the better, but no pressure on them about like, they'll pick it up if they, if they know that school is something they want to do. Um, I have, I have a couple of students now who are at School of Mines and one's a better scholar and the other one is not a better scholar, but he still made sure that he got a lot of scholarships um, because his parents were really upfront with him about what their budget was and early on. So um, the more important conversation is what are their dreams, right? Like, what is it you want to be? Not what do you want to do? Who do you want to be in the world? And that's one of those things that those... Uh, those weekly dates that you could have that conversation about and just listen. And it might change a lot. It probably will. Most gifted students are multi-potentiate and there are a thousand things they could do and do well. So hear them out and, and dream with them because that's fun. It's fun to dream. Um, okay, so uh, this is a quote from, from my book. Uh, we can illuminate and celebrate students' individual value to themselves, their community, and the world in a way that is neither overwhelming nor suffocating, but rather empowering and motivational. Fostering the gift of agency will help kindle the flame of enthusiasm and wonder for them so they may find and actualize their own potential, their own arete. That's what we're hoping for, um, for, our, for our children um, as they move into the world. So... If you're interested in my book, uh, it is not out yet. It should launch this spring. Um, as you can imagine with uh, open heart surgery, I had some hiccups this last year. Um, so it's not quite ready, but it's coming soon. And if you're interested in being on the wait list, I'll have that information for you here in a little bit. I put some helpful resources here at the end. Um, I have Colorado, all of these are links um, and I, and Mark will give you a tiny URL to get this slideshow. Um, but uh, Mentored Pathways and Colorado Mentors are both places that you can find mentors for your child. Um, some cost and some don't. Uh, the, the, let's see, GT Testing and Counseling, I believe is off of CAGT's website. Um, the Summer Enrichment Programs is off of Jeffco. So they've got a great website if you haven't looked at Jeffco GT. Uh, Colleges That Change Lives, amazing website. And like I said, they have scholarship information there and all kinds of things. NAGC, I put those educational standards. And then how to um, empower, or how to email your teacher, rather. I'm sorry, how to email your teacher. Um, I, that I, is in the slideshow, but I put it here at the end also. Also, if you have not gotten in touch with your local uh, gifted affiliate, there's a link here from CAGT about different districts and what you can do if your district doesn't have a local affiliate. And I also put a link to the GT Secondary Perspectives. This is a website. It, some of it's outdated. A lot of it was worked on in 2020, but there's so much rich information in there. And there's actually even, you might've seen a few weeks ago, um, there's actually even a student uh, gifted council that works in the state. So um, if your child is interested in that, I would encourage them to be a part of that. If you want to contact me, there's all kinds of ways to do that. I've got a website. You can click on my picture for that. I've got my, my email. You can email me directly. I'm totally cool with that. Um, Facebook, in, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I don't Twitter very well, but because uh, I talk too much. It's too long. Um, and then uh, you can click there at the bottom if you want to join the wait list for the upcoming book. I'm not going to sell your information. I just will let you know when the book has become available and you can get it. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I'll leave this slide up so you can copy that information. And, um, and uh, Mark, do you have uh, any questions that have been generated? I, I do have a question. I do have several questions and thank you so much uh, so far. Um, I have a question, we have a question that came from the chat and I, can, I think I can kind of generalize it for everybody. So a parent is asking about her son who does not want to participate in the current assignment, uh, which is not working with his strengths, the assignment. Would you recommend that uh, the parent ask that he be allowed to work on something better aligned to his strengths? I would. And I would actually encourage the child to write that email while you sit next to him. I don't know how old the child is, but even if he's a sixth grader or a 10th grader, like sit next to him and ask, you know, help him 
help him craft that email. I appreciate the assignment that you've given. I recognize my strengths as a gifted learner are blah, blah, blah. Um, and I was wondering if I might do an assignment like X, Y, Z. Um, and I, I would really encourage, um, yeah, I would encourage that communication. And again, CC the parent on the email when, when the student sends it, because uh, that I think that's really respectful to the teacher. The teacher knows that the student is, is trying to do the communication um, and that the parent is there to be a support. All right, thank you. Uh, I have one that was, came in in advance from, from one of our frequent listeners. How should we streamline high school programming so it makes sense to gifted learners? That's a really great question. Um, and my experience is that it's actually pretty well streamlined. That's not what the problem is. Most of most students who come back and talk to me, or most students who've talked to me, even when they were in high school, their problem was not that they didn't know um, what needed to happen to get out of school. It was that in many cases, for example, there was very little uh, pre-testing. So a student would get put into uh, an advanced or an honors um, English class, for example. That's what they usually come back and talk to me about. And they, they'd get put into that class and they would spend, you know, the first semester learning how to write a thesis statement when they'd been writing five page, 10 page, beautiful research, research papers for the last two years with uh, an MLA bibliography. And, and they, they were spending this time like learning how to write a thesis statement and then making index cards uh, for their resources. So what they needed was not a streamline, it was meaningful happenings in the classroom. And I'm gonna tell you two other um, anecdotes about that because I think they're important. I've had students who, um, who've left our center and have gone into the high school and they had to take uh, for, for an algebra two class. They could have gone right into pre-calc. They were, they were so quick to catch things, you know, to catch onto things. But the curriculum says, no, you've got to take algebra two first. And so we need to be able to let students test out of those things that they can test out of. Um, and then the other thing, and this this is hard to say, uh, and I and I get it because I was I was a high school English teacher for a while too, um, but. One of the things that I hear students complain about is the rigidity of um, what teachers ask for at the high school level. So it's not it's not necessarily the course. It's the, it's actually like what's happening with the teacher who says, no, I wanted you to write this essay using this information um, or I wanted you to write this essay and you had these three themes that you could work within. Um, I, I've had students who. I'm going to give you one example of a student who came back and said, you know, I wrote this essay and didn't get a great grade on it. And I looked at the essay uh, and it was about, I think it was, I think it was about great expectations. And the student had created a thesis and an argument that didn't align with the particular curriculum that that teacher was teaching. And so instead of saying, you need to bring in outside sources that support your ideas here um, or better use the text, the teacher was just like, that's not one of the expected answers. And so, you know, it doesn't happen often. Most of our teachers are so, so good. I can't even, I can't even celebrate them enough. Um, but sometimes when students are really struggling, it's because there's a rigidity in the classroom um, or there's, uh, or there's no pretesting. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, no, it was very thorough. Um, what about, so you're talking about giving students choice then. So what happens with curriculum in that case? Shouldn't, shouldn't the students be getting these skills in place, even if it's a little bit rigid? Yes, and I 100% agree with you. You know, um, student choice versus curriculum isn't a binary, it's not a binary question, right? There, there are, there, we of course need to do both and we, um, and we must. I, I mean, Aristotle teaches us that we need to, um, 
that we need to name things, that we need to categorize things, that we need to uh, understand and, and seek for the truth in, in all things as, as we understand the world. Um, so certainly, I'll go back to my dental uh, analysis. I don't expect that a person who has good teeth is going to not go to the dentist every six months to get a cleaning and isn't going to be flossing by themselves every day and not and not talking to their dentist about what to do now that I have this, this broken tooth or a cavity or whatever. Right. I mean, there are, there are lots of different levels. Um, I, I teach, oh my goodness, with my international students, but I did in, in my regular classroom too. I teach like hardcore grammar and vocabulary. And, um, but we find a way that the students can utilize that information that's rich and meaningful to their unique learning. Thank you. I knew you had a good answer for that. So, but I, I thought I would throw that Thanks. to you just so, so I'd get it back. So everybody understood. And, and from a fellow uh, high school English teacher once upon a time too, I totally get it. Um, so one more, uh, what is an exciting presence in programs in elementary school in gifted programs? And I get to do this and I get to do that. That attitude starts to change in middle school. It's no longer cool to do that so often. And what about kids who don't want to be gifted or don't want to have gifted services? Like what should what would the approach be there? Like for, for a parent, for example. Right. Well, first of all, like it know that a child who is gifted just by the nature of that term, there is so much pressure, so much pressure that goes along with that term. And you know, then if you top it off with kids who feel like they already, you know, they have perfectionist uh, tendencies or they have imposter syndrome, of course, they're going to be so overwhelmed. Even by the time they get to middle school, they don't want to be, they don't, of course, they don't want to be gifted. It's, there's so much expectation. And I think that um, allowing them to just step back and have fun and remind them they don't have to be anything. And, and one of, the, one of the experiences I had with a student that made me so happy. Um, and then she got to high school and had to do a semester of making index cards, but, uh, <laughs> just for one semester. Um, and I, that story ends really well. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you though, it, in middle school, she was struggling so much and I knew that she could write. She was incredibly articulate. She had a great vocabulary, but she was just struggling. And so, um, she loved technology and I just had her spend almost all of her eighth grade year making videos. And she learned how to do an MLA bibliography at the end of her videos. Um, she learned how to, and she learned so much about videos. Let, I mean, let me clarify that too. But I mean, she learned how to segment out a video. So it had a beginning and a middle and an end. She learned how to um, incorporate a thesis into her, depending on what the video was about, but like a marketing video, you know, advertising, she learned how to incorporate a thesis into it. So I don't blame them for not wanting to be part of a gifted program if a gifted program means that they have to um, produce academically all the time. Like that's so much pressure. So I just turned it into, you know what? Why don't you just have some fun? Like, what is it that you love to do? And that's the beauty of being in this gifted program with me. And, and by the way, with I know a lot of other gifted programs, you know, the other high school gifted programs and the middle school gifted programs, that's what a lot of the teachers will say now. It's like, this isn't about making you write, you know, 47 papers in a semester. Um, this is about, I, I, guess, I guess one of the things I do is take that child to the school and let them talk to the teacher and some students and, um, and find out if maybe that isn't something for them. And if it's not, then find out, how they can be the best version of themselves at their neighborhood school. Um, I know a lot of kids who went to neighborhood schools who were extraordinarily successful. And um, because we have, there really are a lot of great schools and there are so many great teachers out there. We're coming to the end of our hour and uh, thank you so much for 
taking care of our gifted kids. And thank you for sharing your insight and your experience with us. Um, it's so obvious that you're passionate about this topic and, and you bring an energy that makes me say, I know you're that gifted kid, Connie, who grew up <laughs> and took care of gifted kids and are still taking care of gifted kids. So thank you so much for helping out the entire community and for what you've done for Colorado Gifted as well. Mark, thank you so much for those kind words. And thank you all. I mean, thank you so much, KT, for having me here. This was um, such a pleasure. Uh, and I did want to say, you know, if, if a teacher feels like, especially if they're learning about gifted and they're struggling with some gifted students, I mean, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to um, come into schools and work with individual teachers or um, small groups and staffs. So uh, thank you. Yeah, really. Wonderful. Thank you. And like I said, this was a great way to spend February 1st, 2022. Yeah. So much different than a, than a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for those offers. Um, next 